could have counted in one audition process, 10 girls that said the exact same thing. Um, they come in and they stand there and um, they would say, oh, so they were like, I can't sing. I don't, first of all, I'm like, well, what did you think you were coming here to do? But, um, but, but, but they said, I can't sing. And I, and, and I would, the, the first question I asked, I said, who told you that? Who said that to you? And almost to a person, myself, I did. Um, and so what we're able to do is in that moment, build that lie and say, well, guess what? I'm gonna give you my opinion, how about that? Ladies, welcome to Coffee and Words. And this is the season finale of season three. Yay! Congratulations. Awesome. It's great to have you all here. Uh, Cheryl Morgan is co-hosting once again, the fabulous Cheryl Morgan. So thank you for coming on, Cheryl. And all my purple glory. Yes, yes love you. your hair. I love your hair. Well, uh, you have brought a team of people to the show today and I am so excited. So tell me who all you brought. Okay, well, I'll tell you a little bit about them first, and then I'll let them tell you more about themselves. But um, so I moved from Memphis, if you don't know, um, some of our listeners moved from Memphis about um, seven, I guess, almost eight years ago now. And um, this ministry um, is called Angel Street Ministries, but it was a ministry that was um, near and dear to our church's heart um, when I was at our church in Memphis. And um, I have known Mary Jo MJ, one of my besties forever, ever, ever. Watched her grow up into a most gorgeous woman. And then met Jill through being at Hope and all of that. And now Ruth Abigail, RA, as I'm allowed to call her now. Um, and so I was just so excited um, knowing what we were doing on this season, uh, season three, and wanted to involve them and um, just kind of tell you how they're using their creativity and inspiring children uh, in Memphis. So with that, I'm going to start with R.A., who is the executive director and co-founder. Well, all right. Um, thanks, Sarah, Cheryl, for having us. Um, so, yeah, I'm Ruth Abigail. I'm originally from Houston. I got to Memphis in 2010 um, and kind of been doing youth development ever since then. Got connected with Jill around 2011 or so, um, and we, we did music together. And um, I'm sure we might tell the actual story here in a little bit, but we that's how we got connected. And then from there, we kind of um, uh, started to think through what Angel Street could look like. I'm Mary Jo Green. I'm another co-founder with Ruth Abigail and the marketing director, creative director for Angel Street. Um, I get to do all the fun uh, artsy stuff behind the scenes. I don't do any of the music stuff, but try to make our girls and participants and staff uh, an organization look good through fundraising and events and um, just lots of behind the scenes kind of stuff. And I am, I'm from Detroit, but I've lived in Memphis for a long time and um, wife and mom to three kids. Awesome. I'm Jill Dyson, founder of Angel Street, uh, started in 2013. I had met these amazing women um, just prior to that for Ruth Abigail and I, maybe a couple of years before Angel Street started, like she said, 2011. I think that's a, a cool year. I'll go with that. Um, and with Mary Jo and I, we've actually been, uh, we were connected um, several years prior to through women's ministry at Hope. And that's kind of the events team that we were working together on for many different retreats and all kinds of campaigns in the past where we um, collaborated. She brought the creative side and I would often lead worship and do music and content for these events that Hope Church would host. And so we were connected there and um, they were the first two phone calls I made when Angel Street started, which was originally just going to be a one-time choir performance for this Christmas dinner. And um, obviously God had other plans. Awesome. Wow. I'm so excited to have you guys here because um, mentoring young people is something that is very dear to my heart. Um, I've done this for a number of years. I had my own nonprofit um, years ago with community theater and being able to really see how it enriches young people's lives and how it 
it, it gives them so much confidence and helps them so much in their life. And so I really, we're going to get into all the beautiful, wonderful things that Angel Street Ministries um, does. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about leadership and the arts and how the arts fosters um, leadership skills um, in young people and confidence and specifically music because you guys are geared very much towards music um, and specifically young women because I think that is very important that we're fostering leadership and, and various skills and things in young ladies. So how does the arts do this and how is that important in involving young people in the arts for those purposes? while back, one of the things we do, of course, we do performances all the time. Every time we do them, we do, um, you know, we do SWOT analysis. We've taught the kids what that means. So we just, uh, we go and we evaluate what it is that we do. So our first performance involved a lot of uh, old, uh, older and newer student, students, right? Students who have been with us for five years, students who had just come. Um, so we did a, a, an analysis and we we give the reins to the, to the kids. Like they they take it. We ask them what they thought and they do not hold back. And so one um, one young lady who's been with us for about four years, she said something that has stuck with me um, and I think all of us for uh, uh, th this entire season. And essentially what she said was she was she was uh, crit critiquing the, the everyone. Right. Um, and just challenging the group to say, hey, y'all, we are not like we're not like a regular after school program. We are performers. We are, we have to pay attention. We go out and do stuff in front of people. And basically like, hey, we've got to do better. We got to raise the standard. And um, that to me is what we get to foster. This young lady, if you knew her five years ago, barely spoke. I mean, she, 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 she was highly insecure, struggled, and, 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 you know, personally, family wise, you know, it, she just was not the same person. And she she has kept coming. She's kept challenging herself. She is now a soloist. She's a leader. She's in the ensemble and um, and, and wants now to do like entertainment. Like she wants to be she auditions to all the, for all these different places just randomly on her own. And um, for, for us, I think that is what creative leadership does. Um, and it doesn't in a way that helps young people manage help with uh, healthily manage health is that a word? Uh, it, it helps them manage the rhythms, I think, of struggle and um and fulfillment. Because I think that's what creativity really is, just expressed, right? The man like struggle and fulfillment. You got to keep going back and forth and, and wrestling with that until you get something beautiful. And that's that's something that um that, that I see in her and I see in so many of them. And so we get an opportunity to foster that. Uh, and and that's that's kind of, I don't know. I, I think I lost myself in your question there. I don't really know. That was if, awesome. So um, tell me what what are the target ages of these these girls for those who, who don't know much about the ministry? Yeah, just to kind of give you some background, we are actually, most of our staff are product of the arts. And so if not all, um, definitely the the music team, but even Mary Jo had art growing up and access to arts. And so that was very important to us as a staff to make sure that we provided that. And so we do engage a group of our city, our, our zip code is 38107. It's a beautiful area of Memphis that often gets a little bit less attention. And so we are, um, we've always been there. That's our flagship location. Um, and I think it'll it'll be there, you know, for a while because we're very invested in the community. And our age range is eight to eighteen, all females. So we kind of provide and fill a void, not just for the arts and access and after school music programming, um, but really leadership development um, that um, is creatively approached, like Ruth Abigail said. As often the centers that are kind of similar in scope to what we do with after school engagement and and the ages that we recruit, they offer a lot of recreation stuff that doesn't always fill that space for a female. Sometimes it does. In fact, we have some participants who've been with us forever who are having to make decisions between basketball and Angel Street, um, but they are we are offering something that is not being offered specifically for all females. And that's something we just really pride ourselves on as being unique 
and not having competing organizations that duplicate programming. So we're really, you know, rounding out what's being offered um, at the center we're serving in. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And I love hearing you say that because that is something um, that has struck me about, um, you know, bringing young people out of their shell, um, Ruth, in, I've seen young people who would only work backstage, didn't want to be, wouldn't talk, were very, very shy, very, very introverted, um, just didn't really even want to be seen, but would help a little bit backstage. And I've seen them go from that to through a process of really maturing and, and just coming out of their shell, seeing the leading role um, on stage. And, you know, just, I mean, really come out to where now they're inspiring other people Absolutely. and those leadership qualities, they're able to pass that on and then bring up others. I've seen that happen more than once. And it inspires me because it shows me how crucial the arts is to, to every facet of, of <laughs> society and into everyone's lives um, and, and how how often I you know, think about when programs do get cut or when there's a lack of funding or there's not as many, it depends on the community. I know where we are, there's not as many artistic outlets for young people um, here. We're out, I'm outside of Nashville. So Nashville has quite a bit, um, but in some of the smaller communities outside of Nashville, there's not always a lot of opportunities for that. So it's so important. So I love what you guys are doing with that. So let's get into, tell me um, maybe some things that you have seen um, and some things that you've been able to do working with these young girls uh, within um, your program? I'll start. One of those things um, is not everyone, everyone appreciates music, I think. Um, but not all of our girls are necessarily going to be musicians or artists or singer songwriters one day. And in since we began, I've realized there is so much around the music industry that goes behind the person actually behind the mic or holding it, holding an instrument. Um, and that's where I'm excited to be able to plug in in those areas, the business side, the art side, the management side, uh, promoting. Um, and so it's neat to be able to see our girls thrive in some of those areas in addition to using their voice to sing. So um, one of our girls, um, Courtney, is an artist. She is a pianist. She um, enjoys singing, but she kind of stays to the back at times. Um, and there was one project that I came up with to make a t-shirt um, that said lifting voices to lead. And it had the, the Memphis bridge on it. And I thought, well, I can design it. I could try to draw it. Let's have one of our, our one of our girls actually design it. So we asked Courtney to hand letter, hand draw the uh, Memphis Bridge with some stars in the background, um, just to, for her to have free reign. And we used that for a campaign for, for a, good, a good while, made t-shirts and sweatshirts. And just to be able to provide that um, opportunity for her to shine, to actually see if I had someone design a t-shirt or put my design on a t-shirt and then sell it and give it to people and cups and all different koozies at, I don't know, I should, probably 13, 14. Um, that would be so cool to be able to see that. So just to provide leadership opportunities in that way that goes beyond singing or performing on stage. Um, I'm just excited to see those kind of roles in a lot of different areas through Angel Street. Yeah, it looks yeah. like you're fostering an entrepreneurial um, spirit within them, which is so, yeah. um, tell me a little exactly. bit more about that. Well, well I, go ahead. Oh, go, you know, go ahead. Mary well, I mean, but that's the other thing is we're not trying to say, go do this design for us. We're seeing she likes to draw and we want to foster those, those passions inside of each one of our girls and try to tailor those entrepreneurial opportunities for them if they are interested in it. Jill, Jill, you've probably got something about the entrepreneurial well, and, and even just leadership in general, I think, because that's what we do more of is just look for leadership opportunities. And that was kind of one example of someone leading in their skill set. Um, one of our, you know, kind of 
visions uh, for our program um, is for our girls to understand their value first and foremost. And a lot of times they come in our doors and need that just as a, a foundation to know who they are, um, know their worth. They wrote a song called Worth, um, and it's beautifully written about the value that they bring as human beings, as women, um, as unique and individually made, you know, um, in the image of Christ, uh, we, we often get times to really invest into that. Um, and then the second is to understand, uh, to understand their value, discover their purpose, um, which is much of what she just illustrated with that example. It's just finding what is, what are they uniquely gifted to do? So we expose them to a lot of different possibilities throughout our programming, um, taken even deeper dives. Ruth Abigail has expanded and deepened the program process so that everyone has great opportunities for exposure. We have, we do travel, we do college visits now. There's Crew University, which I'm sure Ruth Abigail would love to talk about, but these are all different exposures that give them a broader view of what's possible for them. Um, and then become creative leaders is our last point of our vision statement that we just really, it's kind of our end goal is to develop leaders. And I see it a lot. I was going to give just one small story of just last week, walking through, came in a little bit later, I was bringing some um, uh, little gift cards for for uh, Thanksgiving to give to the families for all their support throughout the year. We had a donor that made that possible. But when I was walking through, there were all the sections, the altos were in one room, you know, tenors, and then the sopranos, and they were all individually meeting. But what was unique about that is that we had section leaders that were teaching. And these are participants who've been with us for a while, who are part of our crew, and they were teaching the parts to uh, participants. That's leadership right there. And those are really fun examples to watch happen. And they're happening all the time. The young lady that Ruth Abigail spoke about, that's just giving people a view of who we are without us having to do that. It's just really neat to watch, to watch that kind of happen and unfold over the years. And can I, let me, can I tell, I'm going to tag on to what Jill said about that moment, because another cool thing about that moment was um, they did, they were, they were, they were challenged to basically like, Hey, we have to perform and, you know, they're young people, they're, they're, they're teenagers. So they, they struggle with paying attention and they struggle with staying on task. And our choir director, who's brilliant at this, um, basically was like, you guys teach yourselves then because you obviously don't want, you know, you're not in a place where you're ready to hear from me. And so she challenged them to say, if you want to, if you want to be prepared, you, you think you figure it out. And they did, and they figured it out. And they, they didn't just, they didn't just decide, well, all right, we're just going to like chill out and not do anything and, and just, you know, just throw away this rehearsal. We're going to go ahead and step it up because that's something that we, we want to do it. And so they ended up doing that, right? And and I think that is the, the moment. So it's just like, things aren't always perfect. They're not always gonna go exactly as planned, but how do you pivot and shift? And so that skill and being able, them being able to do that in the context of our programming is, is, is everything and it's gold. And that's something that we hope we can, that we hope is transferable, right? Outside in the world. Like when you are, when you're faced with something and there's a challenge that comes your way, can you pivot quickly and just do what you have to do? Um, and so that's that's a huge that's a huge asset. So I love I love those moments. And our team is very dedicated to um, to instilling leadership and not doing things for them and not coddling them and not 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 like not setting the bar low. Like no, we set the bar high. You meet it or you, you don't like, and then you're going to have to feel the consequences of that. Um, and we have seen so much growth with that kind of mentality. And it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Wow. I love that. And that is such an important and necessary skill to acquire. Um, Jill, you've mentioned worth and value and, and teaching these girls, those things. And do you find, or have any of you found a big need for this as you get so many people coming in to your programs, um, young ladies struggling to find their place in the world and to really know their, their worth and their value. Is this something that you see a lot? I, I tell this story every now and then as it comes up, but one of my vivid memories at the very, very beginning was, um, the first day 
that we decided to become a full program. We had already had auditions and we had our participants coming to the center. And I had a young girl who showed up early and um, she was eager and excited to be part of it. And she was even holding my hand going to and from the front door to the back. And as soon as we were going up to um, greet and take back and you know, direct back um, a new group of students. Um, the director of the center at the time stopped us in our tracks and said, oh no, she is not allowed in this building. The little girl I'm holding hands with. And I was just like, okay, oh, oh. I was like, what? This precious little girl <laughs> holding my hand. Um, she said, she's a bad girl and she is not allowed into this building. And I you know, fully respected the center and look, they have a lot of challenges. It is, it's not an easy job. And there was um, the systems at the time it was run by the city and it just, it was a lot of chaos, a lot of times. So I can, I could totally empathize and understand um, with the leaders who were instructed at the time to um, just really, you know, have to run things smoothly and, and, and take disciplinary actions. They had, um, and, but we were stuck because I just saw her face fall and she had made some bad decisions in the past and was in trouble quite a bit at school. And what had happened is that she had had so much freedom and time that wasn't constructive or put into its proper place. She was a leader. You could tell she was um, already showing leadership skills as she was coming in early and wanting to help and plug in. She just didn't have anyone who was directing that into a positive space. And so I can emp empathize with that. I'm a middle child, very spirited as my mother called me. And so I just knew if I didn't have that outlet, I don't know, you know, I could have made some choices that weren't, um, but I was always involved in theater always had something creative to put that energy into. And so as we kind of discussed with the, the leader at the time, I said, it, I'll tell you what, she has a clean slate with us. Can she come back? Um, and we'll talk to parents. We'll do whatever's necessary, but she wants to be in our program. Can we give her a fresh start and we'll report back and we'll give, we'll touch base and make sure that we follow rules of the center, but can we do this? But I remember having this just moment of panic. I went to the bathroom in the middle of it all and just was like, what am I doing? God, how do I, how do I even go? Where do we go from here? And I just remembered so like, just almost audibly this voice of saying that is not her name that is not her name. She's not a bad girl and she just needs to learn her name. So that's where we start is like, you have worth, you have value. You're made in the image of Christ. And we want to invest that. Even if we don't say those words, we want everything that we do as leaders and as staff to reflect that. And whenever there's teachable moments, we, and I see it happen week in and week out, especially with new participants, we're constantly, our staff is amazing. They go straight to our participants if they notice something's awry or there's something struggling. There's a lot of emotions going on after school. There's a lot of heavy stuff happening in the families in the house and even at school day and lots of fights happening. And so there's an opportunity right and left for our amazing staff to just walk beside, pull aside, talk, discuss, ask questions. Ruth Abigail's great at that and has led a team into being responsive in that way. And it's just opportunities to grow. And, and to come alongside, but that's kind of one that stands out as just value worth. Yeah, that, and I know maybe people don't always mean to say certain things or in a certain way, but we have to be so careful how we talk to young people, because there may be that one thing that sticks in their brain. If, if they hear I'm a bad girl, they're going to believe that. And if they hear it enough, it's going to impact their future. And, and how they interact with the world. And so it's so important that we encourage and strengthen and, and really are careful the words that we use and, and how we relate to young people, because especially if they're coming from any kind of environment where they're being told that they lack value and worth, you know, every little thing that had, they're going to be maybe a little bit more sensitive, I think, to things that, that happen in their, in their life. So, so important. Thank you guys for doing that. Thank you for um, taking the time to work with these young people. Um, so tell me about the different programs that you have. And I know we've kind of talked a little bit about that, but tell me, um, get, go into a little bit more detail in all the various ways and that you outreach into your, your community. Yes. Yeah, so um, 
we have a mixture of, of activities that revolve around music and mentoring. And so our philosophy uh, really has become to do more with a core group of students than to spread it out, right? Spread too thin. So we wanna, we, we wanna focus on um, layering our activities with one participant as opposed to having a bunch of participants do one activity. Um, and we see that that is, that is where the impact goes. So we have every, every girl that comes through is a part of the choir. Um, and then that's, that's where everybody starts. And you have opportunities from that point to get involved in some other things. Uh, the other primary activity is crew and crew is our um, more um, advanced ensemble that's specifically for middle and high schoolers. You have to audition again to do that. And it's a, it's a, um, it caps at about 17, 15 to 17 girls. We have a total right now of about uh, 40 on the roster. We see about 30 to 35 weekly. Um, and so that's about, yeah, so about 17 of them are in that group. And then we have um, some particular mentoring opportunities uh, that are outside of rehearsal. So something called Flock, which is a um, character building, Christ-centered um, small group, if you will. We have it for middle and high school and then we have it for elementary. And so they come and we essentially just do fun activities, right? Um, and we go places, we do things, uh, we have great conversations, we bring in speakers, we do that. So that's something that they have the opportunity to get into. And then we have another layer called Power Partners, which is our individual mentoring program, which again, they have the opportunity to get, um, to get involved in. So um, there are about, we, we kind of, the way we look at it is, we call um we call participants that are doing every piece of what they're able to do in Angel Street. We call them full time students, right? Full time Angel Street participants, and um we have about six over sixty percent of students that choose to do that. So that means that every available opportunity they have, they take it, um and that means that they are with us at least three to four times a week. Um, which, which is, which is how we, how we measure the impact is we, we have to have the time we all, I mean, you know, and so it's the time and then the, the, the quality of that time with that we have, um, in each one of those programs, we have five primary outcomes that we're looking to, 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 um, instill or five characteristics that we hope is out the outcome of, of their time with us, um, confidence, courage, leadership, sisterhood, and love. Um, and so those are plastered on the wall. Um, we say it all the time. The girls can tell you what that is. Um, and so it's something we want to keep drilling. Th those are the things that we're hoping when you leave Angel Street, you have grown in each one of those areas. And our activities are are designed to foster that growth. Um, I, the, the one that really sticks home is sisterhood. They really, um, you know, Sarah, one of the things that we were talking about just uh, speaking into the lives of young people and working with young people over the past about 10 plus years, the most impactful, impactful thing that I have seen are their peers. Um, so the, 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 the ones that they're around for the most part, that's what they're going to look like. And we, and we want to be a community where we can have, where they can have healthy relationships with people their own age. And that's so hard to figure out how to do without some sort of um, example of what it looks like. And so I love, like, I think our, I hope, and I, I believe so, our team it can be an example of how how you manage sisterhood. And then they watch us and they emulate that, right? And I'm not saying that that a lot of them come from places and homes where that's absolutely there, but it's hard. School is hard. Um, you know, friendships are hard. They're getting, it's just, it's a mess, right? Um, Being girl is hard. It's hard. It's just hard. Like you can't, it's, it's, and so but when you get, when, when they get here, our hope is that the, the place is safe enough for you to explore what healthy relationships really look like. Um, and so I think that's the characteristic that probably sticks home the most, because I think that's the greatest need um, that, that young girls have. They need to know that they have people that's going to have their back. Um, and so that's, that's anyway, that's, that's what we do. That's the program. And of course we perform everywhere. We do that. We perform, we write music, we record the music. Um, so we, we do all those things. One thing that we realized early on too, with, and Jill and I are doing women's ministry events, I mean, women 
are women, no matter where you go, whether you're young, old, I mean, we all have the same joys and struggles and quirks and all the different um, things that come with being a girl. And our girls, they're leaders in their own lives. And they have some hard things that they go through during the day. And we want to be a place where they can have fun and be a girl. We have high expectations and we do have these outcomes, but we want to cherish them being girls. And that's why we're only serving females. We don't want to introduce boys into the mix. Some people do ask us, why is this all female? Things change when you add a boy into the room. And we want for girls to be authentically themselves so that they can find who they are and explore those opportunities to grow and to thrive as a female. So I I noticed when I was doing a little research, you know, you have these pep points, which are awesome because you've got encouragement, you've got all of these things, but of course, what, how is that measurable on a daily basis or on their involvement? So tell us a little bit about that and how the girls react to that. (laughs) All right, Sherry, you're going to make me be honest. So, so, (laughs) so we got to update that a little bit, but, um, so I'm making a note of that. But 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 the but but pet points was an idea that kind of came about to do exactly what you said. Like, hey, let's let's uh, incentivize some things, you know, and so the girl the girls can can work their way up. I will say this: we um, we absolutely encourage a couple of things that are key to that success. The first is commitment of, and that's just coming show up um, when you are here. Um, be like, stay ready. And we use that like, Hey, you, are you, are you ready? Like, are you ready to learn? Are you ready to perform? Are you, are you prepared? Um, and so we, like commitment, preparation, um, and, and maturity, like there's a, we, we, we want to teach some professionalism. So it's like, Hey, when we're out there, we are not, you're, I don't want you, like, we're a group and we have to behave as one. And we have that expectation. I, I, I mean, and, and on the stage, we're going to behave as one. So we do, we pay attention to those things and um, we, we try to instill that. I, I, one example, and this is one that like, like Jill said, we don't, we don't, we don't lower the bar. One young lady at her very first performance and she, she wasn't having a great day. Um, And she, she just, she just could not shake it. And I get that. She's a, you know, she's a teenager. It's just what it is. Well, listen, we're performing. We're on the stage. Look, you're going to have to, come. and I have to literally just have to take her off and just say, Hey, look, you got to come down. Just, we can't, we can't do it. And so mid performance, she was on the end, thankfully come on. And, and she got off and she, and she, she didn't like it. Um, but it was something she needed to experience. She experienced it. And we talked about it. Her mom talked with her about it. Like it was, it was one of those moments it was a teaching moment um, but those those are the moments that we have to look for um, in, in order to uh, in order to help them to grow. So you know, e- even though it may not be formalized in 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 the pet point strategy, we are um, it's those things that I would say we're looking for as far as w- what's as if this is working. Are you showing up? Are you prepared? Um, and are you are are you professional? Like. Mm-hmm. You mentioned parental involvement, you know, and so how do you see that feedback from the parents? Give me some, some stories about that, because I, this is an amazing opportunity. I mean, you know, for children to be involved, especially in a neighborhood or, um, you know, an area of, of Memphis that's, you know, not known to have these programs. So I'd love to, to know how the parents, I mean, I'm sure they're extremely appreciative. And speaking of that too, I know these are public school children. So how do they respond to this being a God-centered, Christ-centered uh, program as well? Y'all gonna make me talk? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, okay. So your, your first question as far as parental involvement, um, we, we have incredible parents. I, th- I think it's really cool. And, you know, all of us have been involved. We, we, we know what performance is. And so anytime, you know, I think when parents see their, their, their child perform, one of the things like, particularly with Jill and MJ, I, they, they are event extraordinaires. I mean, the, these women know, I mean, they have the X, the bar of excellence when it comes to presentation, it's just, you know, unreal. Um, and so when, when we have any, any performance we have, 
especially if it's one that we're putting on. It's, I mean, it's not like, I don't think parents are prepared to see the level of excellence that they see and that they see their girls really involved in. When that happens, barring something crazy that doesn't prevent, that prevents them from not coming back and not being engaged, they're not going anywhere. And not only that, they're going to make sure that they do what it is that's necessary for them to keep coming, right? And so um, they come, we, we, we've just developed a great relationship with them. We had a parent night earlier this semester. That was the best one we've ever had. I mean, we had 60 plus people in the room. It was unheard of. That's been doing parent nights for years. I've never had that many parents show up to a parent night. Um, and I think we just have a lot of people who are really invested. And then they share it with the people that they know. Um, so I think, yeah, parents have been great. Um, they, I've got, we've now got parents that are helping to carpool. Um, mm -hmm different students that can't get rides. So we don't, we're not taking them. So they kind of said, Hey, we'll help you out in that way. They're incredible. Um, and, and so they're, they're really an extension of the team. We partner in this thing. This is not, this is angel street. You know, this isn't us. We don't take the kids home. They're not our kids. Um, we partner with parents to make this happen. And I think that they are grateful and they see the, they see the benefit for it. So I, I think that that's why a lot of them, um, are, are, are so, um, are so engaged, you know? Yeah, I've seen such a growth. Um, so when we first started, I was kind of the executive director doing, you know, multiple roles until we grew a little bit and then, you know, God put other people in place. And, um, I would say God, because I had no clue what I was doing. And so we were just kind of walking by faith. Um, Ruth Abigail did a ton of really, um, programmatic support and advising as we were growing until we got that glorious day in 2020, lucky for her, right? <laughs> that she jumped over and joined us full-time as our executive director. But the challenges that I had early on that she has been able to really invest time and expertise and wisdom and also experience being in, you know, youth development for years has been the game changer. And even staff management and development has been all her I mean, just vision and doing, and it has been a game changer on so many levels that I do feel like today we are firing on all cylinders, everyone operating in their gifts. Um, but specifically just a shout out to Ruth Abigail for just getting us focused on that. We saw so much more participation. Uh, she mentioned that parent night blew me away. We were packed. And oh, I remember the first audition that we had no one showed up. <laughs> and I mean, no one. Um, and so it was just, you know, it's just a night and day difference. And it really just shows you that we've got something really special happening now. And it absolutely is a game changer when parents are involved and engaged and see the value of what we're doing and then are paying their hard earned dollars on time for the girls to participate in extra stuff like our exposure trips and the things it's just it touches my heart and soul and i just know that what what's happening right now is different because of that and because of leadership now and it's just really great and we always were a great choir we had singing but what i love that most of our conversation around our programming today has very little to do with music and performance it's literally all about what happens before and and leading up to a performance that we're what we're about, you know, and the familial sense um, from the families that we engage and, you know, but the participants talk about the family aspect of what we all are. So sisterhood is a beautiful way to describe what we want them to have, you know, cultivated in their culture of, of participants. But then as staff, you know, that was a really great way she described what our hope for, you know, I mean, we just struggle as women, you know, as adults with relationships and competition and all of the things. So why not start young and teaching those moments and like do it together, you know? So I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and with partnering with the schools in the neighborhood, um, we're, we're in the neighborhood where Isaac Hayes and Elvis Presley attended school and, and, and other great leaders. Um, I mean, Aretha Franklin came from Memphis and, um, just seeing that access to arts has been cut, um, is, is sad to all of us who are artists, musicians, um, lover of the arts, creatives. And it's been neat, um, to see some of that 
come back into the schools, but um, to be able to provide an after school program as we partner with the teachers and administration at um, within the schools. We have a school that's uh, really right across the street from Bickford Community Center. Um, some staff members will go and, and meet the girls after school, walk them over. We've um, even partnered with some principals in the past to reroute a bus to be able to pick up the girls from school to go to our community center where we have our rehearsals. Um, a lot of it is just developing those relationships with the schools. They've had such turnover. Um, a lot of them are charter schools. And they've had different turnover through the years. And we have just worked hard to build that trust with the staff and then the new staff. And um, I think a lot of organizations come and go within the schools at times. And Angel Street is here to stay. And we've proven that we're trustworthy. And um, we've, we we kind of know, we know what we're doing and, we, and they want to work with us. So we're able to go into the schools at the beginning of the school year and hold auditions, um, which is a huge gift to us um, to be able to be right there in the schools. Um, we have our spring concert at one of the schools. Um, it's just been a great, great way to just partner. We They know that we are a uh, Christ-based organization, um, but we're working with charter schools and public schools and, and, and they just know where our heart is and what our drive is to build creative leaders and to love on the girls. That's wonderful. Um, I love when you talk about getting the parents involved because very often there can be maybe a disconnect or we're all so busy and sometimes parents and kids unintentionally end up living almost separate lives. You know, they've got kids have these activities over here. The parents are working, they're busy, there's things going on. And so sometimes there's not as much time, you know, spent in, in that bonding and that family unit. And so anytime we can get away from maybe technology and the busyness of our daily lives and bring families together or parents and their and their children can come together and, and really learn more about each other and have something beautiful like that to bond over that that touches my heart that is a really important thing and you, you talked about um auditioning and i was going to ask you what your audition process is because i have found that it's such an important thing for young people even the younger they are the better even because it teaches them so many skills even preparing for job interviews when they they get older and the corporate world now has panel interviews and things that a lot of young people are, are having to experience and so um it's it's such a it's such a really good um way to um, help them work on pre preparing things and building confidence and so forth. So I encourage all parents out there to um, maybe find a way for your young people to, um, to go audition for something and to get involved in programs where you have to prepare an audition. So what is that like? What do they have to do when they come in to um, audition with you guys? So, okay, I'm really glad you asked about that, Sarah, because the audition process is literally my favorite of the entire year. It is it is, it is my favorite moment. Um, so if you can imagine, I mean, we do, we audition uh, mostly third through eighth graders. I mean, we, we have up to 12th, but most of our targeted um, schools are elementary and middle. And so um, we, uh, we, we, the schools, we, we sign them up, their parents sign them up to audition. So we go in, you, the schools will give us a room and um, kind of take them out um, in groups via class and they come in. And they have two options. They can sing either Happy Birthday or they can sing a song of their choice. The song of their choice is my favorite because you just never know what you're going to get. Um, and and I, I always, always encourage if there's any, any, if anybody needs a pickup for their day, come for 10 minutes and watch these third graders audition. And I, you just, you, you've never, it's just, you're, you're going to be laughing for another week. Um, so they, they come in, most of them are incredibly nervous. They, um, you know, most of them, some of them aren't, aren't at all and completely confident. Uh, mm -hmm. Some have the right to be confident and some probably shouldn't be as confident as they are. Uh, but, but they, they, um, they absolutely, they, they, they go in one way and then they leave another, which is really cool to me. Um, particularly with middle schoolers, I don't know about y'all, middle school is like, 
well, it's just a nightmare. No, I, I, I don't, I, I hated middle school and I, and I haven't yet met a person who enjoyed it. And I think that's the case uh, with a lot of our middle schoolers. It's just a rough season. So they'll come in, the, the middle schoolers this year were really interesting. I could have counted in one audition process, 10 girls that said the exact same thing. Um, they come in and they stand there and um, they would say, oh, so they were like, I can't sing. And first of all, I'm like, well, what did you think you were coming here to do? But, um, but, but, but they said, I can't sing. And I, and, and I would, the, the first question I asked, I said, who told you that? Who okay. said that to you? And mm -hmm. almost to a person, myself, I did. Um, and so what we're able to do is in that moment, peel that lie and say, well, guess what? I'm going to give you my opinion. How about that? Um, let those of us who have been doing this for a while tell you what you what what you're able to do, not you, or, or tell you what you're not able to do and not you. Like, like, don't let it be in your head. And so we were, were able to say, and every single one of them, they they made it. I mean, they were they did a good job and they just needed to hear from somebody else that, no, you can sing. You do have the ability. And even if you're not as good as you want to be, we're here to teach you. You don't have to figure it out by yourself. And, and so th just that moment, before we even start programming at all, the audition process is the taste that they get of, of what they're about to go into. You, you're you going to be around women who are dedicated to helping you grow in this thing that you want to be good at. And you don't have to worry about it. It's a safe place. It's not We're, we're not here to judge you. Um, and we're, we're here to really help you. And it's like, I guarantee you, if you give us the rest of the semester, you will believe you can sing. And nobody says that after that. Nobody says that. They're singing. Um, so I, the audition process is just, it's so much fun um, for, for, for really for that reason. We really get, we get to pour into them immediately um, and speak immediate truth into their lives. Um, and they, they, they leave a little bit different most of the time. But early on, we have had some that weren't quite blessed with the gift of staying in tune. Um, Jill, what, what have we done in the past for our first? We gave them other jobs when we, when we didn't have an audition process in the beginning, see, these are the things that other people do way better than, <laughs> than I did. And, um, I will say we gave them cue cards. They would, they would hold props. They would, they would, <laughs> they would do all kinds of other parts as support for the artist because there is something that cannot be taught and it's pitch if you are tone deaf that is not a learned thing that anybody on our staff as excellent as they are can teach it is either in you or it's not and when it's not it really does throw off an entire group so we do have that one that is really all we're looking for with this audition process and just to have a baseline also to hear the range you know our our instructors our vocal coaches are working with them to see okay are you alto are you are you comfortable singing high or lower are you soloist potential how much experience have you had in the past just so we know a basis of range but the the entry point really is about pitch so that's right <laughs> yeah, it's There's just place for everyone. Oh, sorry. No. I was just going to say you're you're teaching them that there is a place for everyone that we all have skills that we all have gifts and talents and there's a place and a way for you to use them. So if maybe it didn't work out with this thing that you wanted to do, there is a place for you and that's important. Um I think even as adults sometimes we need to hear that, we need to know that that we mm -hmm. there's a place that we're needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We, we all are creative. Some people will say, no, I'm not creative. I can't sing, write, dance. I, I am quick to tell many people, adults and children alike, each one of us is creative in our own ways. It could be cooking dinner or balancing a budget or decorating a house. Um, every one of us has our own creative gifts in our unique way. And it's just a matter of recognizing it and using it um, the way that, that we've been told to use and our think, inner voice being told. Yeah. And changing that narrative, uh, Ruth Abigail, like you, you mentioned right off the bat, you know, because that's the thing, Mary Jo, you, I can't tell you, both you and Sarah have told me a million times, if not once, you know, you are creative. And I'm like, I'm not creative like you guys, you know, but you 
you know, again, there's different different ways of that. And I believe seeing that encouragement, um, kind of kind of picking that out a little bit and going, okay, you really are good at this and having that encouragement um, and the confidence to just kind of build on that foundation, um, you know, that acceptance, um, that encouragement is just, you know, amazing. And so, yes, we all, we all need that kind of keep going back to that. Absolutely. Well, tell me how this program has impacted all of you and the people who work for the program and how has this changed your lives? I'll start. Um, I had no thought that I would be working in youth development. Um, I knew I wanted to be a mom, um, but I thought that I would be doing advertising for a big corporation or at an ad agency. Um, but God had different plans for me to be um, running a communications department at a large church here in Memphis, um, connecting with Jill to do uh, different events. Um, and I quickly realized that there was, um, more to what God had planned for me. I've got my mug here that says unexpected surprises that I made. And people are like, aren't all surprises unexpected. Um, and I'm like, well, no, sometimes there are, there are surprises that are like, wow, that just took me way, way out of what I, what I really thought was going to take place. But there is a path that God had for me to be able to use my gifts to help raise money, help um, help make our participants look the best they can, um, just different ways to intertwine the things that at first I was like, who me? I can't do that kind of stuff. Um, that is just even with marketing, not even youth development, but intertwining those gifts of teaching and, um, camaraderie and art and, um, just the opportunity to serve, um, in the unique ways that God has given to each one of us. Um, I never thought I'd be doing this, but I'm so grateful that I have had the opportunity to be home as a full-time mom as well. And then also come in and just share some of the ideas that I've had or that God's given to me to be able to, um, speak truth with the girls. And I'll go, I'll go next and then we'll end with our amazing leader. Um, I think that the biggest thing for me that I've learned along the way and how it's impacted my life, but I mean, my family, just being invested more in the future of our city and like being passionate about um, these amazing uh, people that we work with, but also, uh, you know, work alongside. Um, we just, we love this part of our city and, and it's enriched our lives. So that's personal. Um, but I guess, career wise, you know, as an artist and worship leader that was drawn to women's ministry, uh, but it looked totally different years ago. Um, and now it's just, it's a, it's a fuller picture of what I think, you know, the calling for women's ministry really was supposed to be all along. Um, but I would say that working independently as an artist for years, um, and even a business owner, um, is different than working with a group. And it's so much more enriching and fulfilling to do that. Um, there's that African proverb that I love. And it's, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I'll end with that. It's cool. That's good. Um, so when I was in college, uh, when I when I was entering college, my, my desired major was music education. And um, I went in thinking I was going to do that. And one of the qualifications for being a music ed major was a recital at the end of my junior, my junior and senior year. Well, when I went into school, I was definitely, I barely feel like I barely made it into the music department. I mean, like I was not actually thinking I was going to major in music. So I was behind the curve on a lot of my peers when it came to some skills that I felt like I needed to have. Um, and when I got to my, so instead of doing a music education major was what I wanted to do. Um, I kind of went another route and did a different music uh, major that did not uh, did not make me do a recital. Cause I was just like, there's absolutely no way I'm doing 45 minutes of music in front of a crowd. Like I'm not doing that. And so um, then I got to my junior year and I, I realized, oh shoot, I made a mistake because I made a decision um, in my freshman year that impacted my junior year. And I made the decision because I was afraid of it. 
I was I, like fear was really motivating me in that moment. And that always stuck with me. So fast forward to when I got here to Memphis, was literally in the back um, of a ch of the church right after uh, right after service. And they made a call for musicians to come up and audition for uh, for the for the group. So it was like a young adult group and they were trying to do a band or whatever. And I'm not one to be like, hey, I'm, I'm going to do anything like I'm absolutely not volunteering myself to do anything. And so I was headed to the back and I, I, I heard God say truly, I don't use that lightly, but I know I heard him um, go back and tell him you play the piano. And I said, I won't be doing that. And so I kept walking. And um, then he said, no, 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 go and tell them you play the piano. I said, okay. So I did, it was a really awkward thing to do, but I did it. Anyway, I went ahead and I started to play. Well, that led me into playing for a lot of weddings for people that um, were in the young adult group. It was through playing for weddings that I met Jill. And that's the only reason we met. Um, and so the thing that this has taught me more than anything, is to not allow fear to motivate you. Like, I can't be motivated by fear because when I'm motivated by fear, I'll miss stuff. And I never want to miss anything again. And in that moment, like, I I realized, like, I could have chosen to just walk out the door because I'm like, I'm not going to do what I'm afraid of again. But because I didn't do that, I got connected with someone who then, you know, this, all this is possible. And it ended up bringing me full circle back to what I really wanted to do anyway. Um, and so that, that was, that has been, I never forget that. That is a moment that will always stick out to me. And I think that is, I am most grateful for that lesson. Wow. That guys are just warming my heart today. This is so beautiful. Cheryl, I mean, how has knowing them and, and your involvement um, and what you've seen with Angel Street Ministries impacted you? Well, um, knowing I, I don't have children, my kids are grown. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of friends that are in different spaces um, than I am, because I think I, I went through everything first in my friend group, you know, had the kid, got married first, got divorced first, you know, had the kid and then, you know, unfortunately became a widow, you know, at such a young age when, you know, so many of my friends are still have little people in, um, in schools. Um, and so, you know, seeing how this has enriched your lives and seeing the impact that it's really making. I mean, this is something that, that, you know, I would have loved to have been in, involved with, you know, years ago. And I, you know, I, you all know, I've been to Africa quite a few times. And, and when we go over there, we worked with children over there. And, you know, I had so many people tell me early on, you don't have to go to, to Africa to help, you know? And I was like, yeah, but that, that's where my heart is, you know? And I, I really didn't know of any opportunities at that time in the early 2000s, you know, to be plugged in. So I think this is such a, a, a great thing that you guys have done. How many years has this been going on when were you founded we will be having our 10 year anniversary okay. one year from now that's so. amazing and just to see the growth and to you know it is just really inspiring for me and knowing that you know you didn't go in and do something you know go into to something that was hard and give up on it you know you've stuck with it i've seen the growth um you know I, i've you know been fortunate enough to be able to, to help out, you know, on some campaigns and, and things, you know, I get, I get Angel Street uh, mail quite a bit, you know, I still have ornaments and, um, you know, I love that. And I love watching, watching you guys grow in the girls. It's just really, really inspiring. So I appreciate what, what y'all are doing and continue to continue to do every day. Cause you are making a difference. Yeah. And so two part question here um, for those, for anyone who's in, because you guys are in Memphis, you're in the Memphis area um, for anyone who is interested in helping with Angel Street Ministries or um, with youth in the Memphis area, um, what can they do? But then also for all the people who are outside of even the state of Tennessee, who are wherever they are worldwide, what are some things that people can do if it's on their heart to help young people, especially young women, but, but any, any young person, how can they get started or get involved? So I'll kind of, um, I'll come from one angle and then Jill, I'll give it to you for another. Okay. 
Um, I, I love the question about what can people outside of Memphis just who are, have a heart for young people do. Um, and, and Mary Jo said it earlier. If you know somebody, if you have a young person in your life, um, listen to them. <laughs> you know, and I and I I think that um, that is uh, that's a, a missing link. Uh, we need young people need to believe that adults believe them and hear them. Um, and so I think listening is, is something to do and just start there and build a relationship. Um, and, and that, that will, that can impact any young person. Right. Um, and, 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 and it doesn't have to be in a formal way. It doesn't have to be through a program. It doesn't have to be through an organization. You can just do that, um, and begin to, to do that with the young people that are right around you. And then if God leads your heart towards a, a, something that's happening in your city, like use that exact same skill and passion to do it for somebody you don't know. Um, and that, that's gonna, that's gonna be hugely impactful. Um, and uh, when it comes to here, uh, when it comes to Angel Street, we have, um, we have several ways to get involved. Um, if you're not following us on social media, um, follow us at Angel Street Memphis on Instagram and Facebook. Um, to our performance we post the ones that are that are open to the public come come to a performance check us out um we always love for people to come and see what we do here at the center um so if you're interested in really just kind of getting just kind of seeing what it looks like coming to a rehearsal we would love for you to do that just contact you can contact myself you can contact jill and um and we can set that up um there are uh, other volunteer opportunities that come up and the best way to get to know that is really just to get to know us and then we can plug you in Right. Um, and, and so we, we want, we want to be able to do that, but, um, yeah, develop relationships. It's, it's really, it's a relationship driven ministry. It's a relationship driven, um, world. And so if we can put ourselves in a position to listen to young people, well, um, I think a lot of things will change. That's wonderful. And so one more time, just to make sure everybody's got it, if they want to follow you or get in touch with Angel Street Ministries, what are all of your, your socials and your, your connectivity uh, places? So yeah. Facebook and Instagram, we are Angel Street Memphis. Um, that's also our website, angelstreetmemphis.com. There's always support. We've got a lot of great videos on YouTube. It's a really strong channel of ours. You can get to it by our website, but you can go straight there. Angel Street Memphis and and just see all of our our growth. Um, we we keep as many moments on there and we capture as many as we can throughout the years. So it'll be a a fun thing from interviews to performances and and stories, impact stories, which are really important as well. Um, music videos that our participants have taken part in for original music to um, all kinds of stuff. Um, so yep, start there. Um, you can contact us. Uh, we have an info at angelstreetmemphis.com email address that you can just ask general questions. Um, you can look us up on our Facebook or our, our website to get us directly if you have specific questions to each one of us. Um, but really just starting by following us because we post a lot of our needs. Um, there's a give button at the top that I will always highlight because that is my role as development director now um, is fundraising. And it's, it's honestly, we are a no pressure organization. We feel like it's an honor to support work that um, brings about such impact and change. And um, so it's an invitation to do that. If you feel led it's hot pink and the top right hand corner, you can't miss it. So and we love to partner with other um, families, foundations, businesses, as we have uh, made large and small fundraising events throughout the year. Uh, we'd love to give shout outs to our sponsors. Uh, we have a big golf tournament annually that we just finished up. And um, we just love any any opportunity that you'd like to sponsor with us to partner um, so that we can promote your business organization, as well as the um, support that you give to us to, to make this work. And you are 501c3. I just want to let folks know that. And there isn't there a big campaign coming up? What is your next big campaign? Fundraising well, campaign. End of the year gifts are great. A lot of people are able, because we are a 501c3, it's a great tax write-off. Um, so any gift, uh, we will issue a tax certificate so you can turn that in in a accounting season. Um, but we are... Um, that is kind of what we're looking at right now. We will host 
a spring event as well. Um, we have a spring concert that features our participants. It's not a fundraiser, but it's a great way to highlight the work that's been done throughout the year. And the participants wholeheartedly create the content for that. So it's a really unique experience to come in and, and be part of. And we have an ongoing campaign, um, our Halo Hero campaign, where um, you can give as little as $11 a month. Um, and we have Halo Heroes that have been with us for many, many, many years. Um, I think we're up into like the 50, 50th uh, recurring monthly giver. Um, it, and that's been exciting just to see the longevity of those who support us with $11 a month or even more. That's wonderful. Well, I'm gonna end on what you said, Ruth Abigail, about listening. Because I think if there's one thing that um, benefits everyone in so many ways is taking the time to listen whether you're listening to young people all of adults we need to take the time to listen to each other when we take the time to really listen to people we can heal so much i'm so glad that you said that i think that's a beautiful thing and it's something that doesn't require a lot of you know it doesn't require money it doesn't require a lot of time and effort it requires sitting with someone just being there and being willing to listen um, and, and then you're growing something from there. So thank you so much. Thank you ladies for what you're doing. Um, thank you for what you're building. And I'm so excited to learn more about Angel Street and I'm so thankful Cheryl that you have brought this to my attention and that I know that this is out there because um, it's already inspired me so much. So thank you all so much for coming on the show and for telling me about it. Thank you, thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. You guys have a great week and uh, we're getting into holiday season. So happy holidays. Congratulations on your first season of Coffee and Words too. Season three. We're oh my gosh. Okay. Season the third. three. Oh my gosh. Okay. I've got a lot of catching up to do. We yeah. just celebrated the one year anniversary of Coffee and Words. So there you go. So the first anniversary of your three seasons. Congratulations. I need more coffee. <laughs> always, always more, more, more coffee. <laughs> all right. Well, I will talk to you all soon. Have a blessed week. Thanks. You too. Thanks. Well. Cheers.